Good morning, everyone. <laughs> this is really fun to have these mics. I, when I came in this morning, I started singing, All of me, why not? <laughs> I was, anyway. So good morning, and I want to welcome you to the League of Women Voters Spring Legislative Breakfast where we um, share our, with our state and federal representatives, and they visit and give perspectives on images in their issues. <laughs> I'm having a delay in this sound. Um, but they're gonna talk to us about the work they're doing, and then we're going to have an opportunity to ask questions. So I'm Jane Powell, president of the League of the Women Voters of the La Crosse area, and I do want to thank you all for coming. The program is being recorded and will be available for viewing on our website in a few days. Um, for those viewing at home, you can type in um, some question and answer or questions in the bottom of the screen. This is a special year um, as we celebrate our 100-year centennial. Our local chapter began at the home of Alice Hickson on August 22, 1924. Our mission today is the same as those remarkable women who have come before us. And that is empowering voters and defending democracy. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization. We encourage the informed and active participation of citizens in government. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues, which is what we're going to be focusing on today. And then we influence public policy through both education and advocacy. Being nonpartisan, however, the League does not support or oppose candidates for public office in any elections, nor does it take a stand for or against any political party. The League's advocacy work is issue-based. We arrive at our pos policy positions through careful study and input from our members. In our position on government structures and procedures, I quote our position. We promote an open governmental system that is representative, accountable, responsive, and capable of making decisions. So as we take this opportunity to better inform ourselves we're very appreciative of the officials and the staff members that are here in La Crosse with us today. In just a few minutes, Ellen Franz will be introducing our guests. Well, I do want you to know that since we're the League of Women Voters of the whole La Crosse area, it includes north up into Trempolo, um, Monroe, La Crosse County, Vernon County. So we have invited, I think we invited nine um, folks, and so we're happy with those who are here today. In just a few moments, I'll have Ellen come up. Ellen Franz is going to enter, oh no, I'm sorry, Chris Haskell. She's the chairman of our Voter Services Committee, and she's going to talk to us this morning about Observer Corps. Thank you, Jane. I am very happy to talk to you about Observer Corps. It's something maybe you're not familiar with that we do. So um, a few years ago, some of us decided we really thought local government was important and we maybe weren't doing enough. And we learned that nationally and statewide, leagues have been doing Observer Corps. So we studied. This is an example of the brochure that National has about Observer Corps. So it's not a new thing, just new for us. 
So 2021, 2022, we did a pilot and um, thought it was successful. So now we're for real. We're not a pilot anymore. So that's why I'm here talking to you. Right now, we observe these committees. So two county committees, the County Criminal Justice Management Council and the County Judiciary and Law Committee. Sally King and Peter Nelson do the CJMC and I do the JNL. To give you an idea of how interesting that is, right now those two committees are pretty focused on the Civilian Review Board, which started way back, and I'm looking at Steve Doyle, he's been instrumental in keeping that alive, but it started way back with the Rodney King murder and concerns in our town about um, people feeling comfortable with police action. So that Civilian Review Board is now going to happen and we who have been observing have been lucky enough to see that whole process evolve. The La Crosse School Board, um, that's Nora Garland, Jean Hammonds, and Rosemary Bodner are currently observing that. And I'm sure you know how interesting that has been in the last few months. So they've had a front seat table um, at process of what schools to close, for example. In the past, we also uh, observed the City of La Crosse Comprehensive Plan, the County Comprehensive Plan, and our chair, and Jan Gallagher, uh, observed that process. Jan is the one that keeps us on track sets up the Zoom meetings, sends out the notes, um, and is our liaison with other committees in the league. So how do you do this? It's very simple. Just go to our website, hit the tab that says Engage on Issues, and then hit Observer Core, and you'll see lots of in information. If you would like to join us, the process is simple. You can choose a committee that you think would be interesting. You observe that committee, and there's three ways you can observe. You can go in person. You can watch the live version of it at your home or if you're out of town. Or you can listen to or watch it later. So it's a real comfortable process. Then you fill out a form, which again you can see on our website takes about 20 minutes to fill out that form. And then you meet with the other committee members once a month. So I've been able to get a ringside seat to Criminal Justice Management Council and school board just from going to those monthly meetings and hearing them talk about. And if you really want to get the inside scoop and not just what's on that form, you should come to those monthly meetings. So. Uh, we're inviting, we're open for business, we're inviting you. And we'd be particularly interested in getting more city uh, committees observed. So if there's something you're interested in in the city and you want to observe that process, uh, contact us, contact me or contact Jan, talk to us today and we'd love to have you join us. By the way, I was thinking this morning, oh, this is so fitting for this election, which I know you're all going to vote in, because every county board member and the La Crosse School Board will be on that ballot. So all the work that we're observing will continue with possibly new people depending on who we vote for. So that's our invitation. Join us. And now I'm turning it over to Ellen Franz. Well, welcome again. 
And everybody now has arrived. And we have uh, Representative Billings, Doyle, and Oldenburg, and Senator Paff here. And I'm going to try to really hold you to no more than 10 minutes. We'll go with the state people first. And if you start going over, I'm going to, I'm going to screech or something like that. So we get everybody have a chance to say what they want to say and then have a chance for people, maybe I'm not holding it close enough, people to um, ask questions. And then at 10 o'clock, we're going to start with our, I haven't seen Mary come in yet, but she doesn't have to be here until 10. Um, and Greg who represents um, Senator Baldwin. So, and we are going to end the presentations and the questions by 1030. Um, Steve, I know, has to be out of here by 10, so that's another reason to keep everybody on schedule. And so I'm just going to ask, oh, I kinda, other than Brad, who's a state senator, I had the three state um, representatives just alphabetically ordered uh, to give up to 10 minutes of a brief introduction and then be available for questions at the end. So that means you're first, Jill. I had a late night last night. I was at the uh, community theater uh, gala fundraiser, and my son and I put in a uh, raffle ticket, and we won the package. So last night, my daughter and I went to a Timberwolves game, and we sat on row B. And I said, I don't know, but this sounds good to me. So we were excited as we drove up. She came from Madison. She said, I don't know if it's worth five hours to go to a basketball game, Mom. And, but my son was in Chicago for a concert, so she drove up and um, so we, we went, we walked in, it was like we were like the, the country mice at a, at, a, at a city mouse event. We were in the back room where they had all the drinks and the food. We couldn't really afford the drinks, they were expensive. $17 for a Bailey's. I'm like, we gotta get back to Wisconsin. <laughs> but, um, but we had a great time and um, but we got home at midnight, so I'm a little fuzzy this morning because my dog, of course, had to wake me up at 7 as usual. So um, we're kind of toward the end of session right now. We have a few days that are still set aside, uh, some for veto override, some for regular session, but um, it appears like we're pretty much uh, done. And um, I had a really great last month of session where I sat down with uh, Speaker Voss and I said, I've got some bills I'd like to get on the calendar. It's really hard for uh, someone in the minority to get a bill on the calendar. In fact, I think last time we figured 2% of our bills even got a public hearing. So um, I said, he said, okay, let's hear it. So I said, I've got a, a bill that legalizes uh, xylazine test strips. My local doctor, Eberline, asked me about this. Um, right now, drug dealers are lacing their drugs with uh, fentanyl. So we legalized fentanyl testing strips last time around. Uh, so that gives an extra high where people were overdosing. They were um, unknowingly ingesting this. So um, xylazine gives a longer high. So it's a greater high and a longer high. The thing is with xylazine, um, if you overdose, there's no coming back. Narcan does not work on xylazine. So we've seen an incredible increase of overdose deaths in Milwaukee with xylazine as a contributing factor. And our first case uh, was found to have included xylazine in an overdose. It was October of 2023. So I worked uh, hard. I found uh, Joel Kitchens on the other side. He helped me with this bill in the assembly. He's a large animal vet. So it worked out really nicely as we were in the committee um, and people were asking about details of xylazine. It's a drug that's used uh, for, for veterinarians to, um, uh, in surgery, they, it, to anesthetize um, large animals. And so he could give a lot of information on that. Uh, we got it through. Senator Jesse James in the Senate was our, my partner. He's been great to work with. And um, Voss said, okay. I said, you can just message it from the Senate doesn't even have to have my name on it. 
he said, okay, we'll do that. And then um, my uh, second one is a bill that passed last week. The governor signed it last week in a really nice ceremony. It was Steve's Law, named for Steve Johnson, who worked at the ADRC here locally. I was looking at a bill uh, to help disabled hunters and the Disability Advisory Board for the DNR uh, suggested uh, this bill and they said Steve Johnson in lacrosse worked on it before he passed away during COVID. I knew Steve and his seeing eye dog Bennett. I knew him well. He was someone who had diabetes and in his 20s lost his vision. Uh, great, had a great life and contributed greatly to our community. And so I said, why don't we call it Steve's Law? And um, and they thought it was a great tribute. The governor, just as a fluke, uh, happened to choose um, the fifth anniversary of Steve's death to sign the bill. So his family came, uh, one of his nieces came, and they said this is a great tribute. They had a picture of Steve. And so the bill would uh, help uh, people who don't have a driver's license get access to the online Go Wild system with the DNR. So. Um, Basically, it's providing equal access to everybody. Rick Solom at w WIZM said, is it smart to have blind people out hunting in the field? And I said, we've got a great program here in La Crosse called NASA. Um, and uh, hunters, they hunt in partnership. So um, it really helps everyone have access to that outdoor recreation. So I was happy the governor signed that. And then the final bill that I asked uh, Speaker Voss about, I said, well, I'm pushing, I'm like, okay, I got two through, I'm going I'm going for gold. And I said, I've got a bill that um, is part of uh, the Human Trafficking Task Force. As many of you know, this has been an issue, anti-human trafficking, especially of children, has been an issue that I've been working on for at least a decade. And um, so my most recent bill is part of this task force that actually made it through, says that children 17 and under don't have to testify in person against their traffickers as a victim or a witness. So a lot of these kids have been brought out of these horrible lives where they've been manipulated, they've been basically tortured by their traffickers, and they get in the courtroom and they shut down because they're afraid. And so this bill would allow them to testify remotely. And uh, I said, that was your task force. It'd be nice to get this bill out of your task force. And he said, okay, we'll go with that one too. So, and then I got a couple resolutions on too. So it was a great run to the end of the calendar. Um, and we'll see the next two bills signed this upcoming week. Um, and then um, we'll see from there. I've got a new uh, district that, where I had Town of Campbell, La Crosse, Part of Shelby. It was basically 20 miles by 15 miles. I could bike around it in a day. Um, I put together my new uh, district in my uh, office. I printed out piece by piece and cut it and taped it back together in this great craft project. And I looked at the board and I've got lacrosse here, town of Campbell, part of lacrosse. And then I shoot out across lacrosse county into Monroe County and Fort McCoy. I have the airfield for Fort McCoy in my district. So it's very different. Um, but I think I was probably one of the first people to be working my new district after we were allowed to. Um, Brad and I went up to uh, Sparta and Nancy Vandermeer, the, the legislator who um, was a previous legislator, she was there, it was the Deke Slayton 100th uh, birthday at the museum there. And so Brad and I went up with a citation. Nancy had a flag. I get along with Nancy really well. And so uh, we did a bipartisan presentation, I guess, of the district. And I'm hoping to win uh, that district next time around. Um, it's a little different up there where people are a little more quiet about their political leanings. In La Crosse, people seem more comfortable. Um, saying I'm a I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican in I noticed at Sparta people were kind of I know you I know you might be our next person I'm a Democrat and I'm like so am I that's great <laughs> okay so um, I'm excited about my new district I'm excited about the way this session has ended and um, I look forward to hopefully still serving the 95th in the next election and I'll take questions at the end Thank you. Thank you. If those of you uh, haven't seen the new maps in the back, I don't know if Steve was planning to uh, talk about it or not. He brought the new map, the old, 
and the new map for a comparison of, of the districts that apply to most folks uh, in our area league. So I'll turn it over to Steve. I'm sorry, I'm not doing last names. I'm kind of assuming everybody kind of knows these folks because they've, they've been with us for a number of years. Thank you, Alan. Um, it's uh, great to be here. I want to uh, talk about uh, some kind of political type of things. Uh, first of all, I, I will comment on the maps. Um, my district hasn't changed a whole lot. What it kind of did was to swap out some of the rural part of La Crosse County for rural part of Trempolo County. So my district goes up through Galesville to Ettrick. Uh, and before, um, actually, La Crosse County at one point several years ago was the only county in the state that had exactly two assembly districts in it. Jill had La Crosse and French Island. I had the rest of the county, and they were an exact matchup. Now La Crosse County is divided into three districts, and uh, somebody was laughing about the 96 that that former mayor and state representative John Menninger is actually represented by Lauren Oldenburg at, at this point, because um, it does go all the way up into the, uh, about the middle of, of La Crosse, the, the 96 uh, district does. Um, so those elections are you know, starting already. I, I think that what we're going to see, unfortunately, is a lot of money spent in elections this time. Um, in the last election, for my race, my w district was the one um, that was kind of going to make the determination of whether the Republicans had a supermajority or not. And so the Republicans and their allies spent a million dollars against me and the Democrats and the Democrats' allies spent a million dollars you know, on my behalf. So $2 million spent for a seat that pays $53,000 a year. I mean, is there something wrong with this? Um, and, and I think that what we're going to see is it's going to the doors will be blown off this year and it'll be even more expensive. Uh, and that's just, that, that's sad. Um, I want to talk about the uh, referendum questions that are on the ballot um, in April. I've had a lot of people contact my office like, what do these mean? Uh, and so I actually post on my Facebook page, here is an explanation. So the first question um, is whether um, outside entities can spend money or donate money to communities to help run elections. And this goes back to the uh, uh, election during COVID where Mark Zuckerberg and his group, his organization, donated money to communities. It, basically, they said, if you're interested in taking money to run your election, let us know and we will give it to you. So in Wisconsin, over 200 communities took money and, and did things like buying PPE equipment because we're in the middle of COVID. Um, and, and, you know, things that were not vote this way or vote that way, but things that helped the administration of the election uh, work much better. This would prohibit that, um, and so it would not be able to have money come in to help local governments to run their elections. The second one is kind of similar, and, and Ellen and I were talking. Um, it says that, that um, the local clerk cannot have non-employees help with their elections. And Ellen was pointing out that the league and other people in the last election went in to help like alphabetize ballots and things like that. Things that were administrative stuff never touched the ballots themselves, but to alphabetize the envelopes that they come in and so forth. And this would say, if you're not a paid staff person, you can't help on an election. Neither of those proposals makes any sense. I'll let Lauren explain why they're a good idea. I think they're a bad idea. Um, and so. Um, if you want any more detail, you can go to my Facebook page, my State Assembly Facebook page, and you'll see um, a, a little more detail in, in terms of that. Um, but those are on the ballot for April, and <clears throat> if they pass in April, that is a, a change in the Constitution, so that will be the law that we, we live under. Um, I, I want to divert my comments for just a minute to talk about local elections. I've been on the county board in La Crosse basically since the dawn of creation, I think, and I'm running for um, re-election this year. We have seen a bad trend in our local elections lately, um, and that is that they have become partisanized. Um, and in the past, um, there were people who would work together. I was part of the group trying to help people um, to get elected to local office, and I know members of the Republican Party said, well, it's the Democrats doing it. 
um, we had, and I'll use his name because he's a good friend of mine, Dirk Gasterlin, uh, former president of Cooley Bank, good Republican. We helped Dirk. Um, nobody would ever accuse Dirk of being a Democrat. And, uh, you know, there are people like him that we helped to get elected. And when people were, would, from the Democratic Party would ask us, well, you know, should we get involved? We were like, no, we don't think that these should be partisan. People can be liberal, they can be conservative. That's great, but we didn't think that they should be partisan. That changed probably maybe two elections ago where the Republican Party then started donating money to local um, candidates, especially for county board and school board. Um, and that was a trend that I was concerned about. This year, that trend is absolutely horrible. If you live in a district that is a, is a contested district for the county board, you know what I'm talking about because you have seen those mailers. Um, they are nasty, they are misleading, they are vicious. They have no place in nonpartisan politics as far as I'm concerned. Um, my successor as county board chair, Tara Johnson, and I submitted a letter to the La Crosse Tribune, which is in today's paper, basically saying, this is, this is not good. This is a bad trend. We, this needs to stop. The other thing in my race and in um, one other race, um, when I read some of those awful letters to the editor saying how horrible some people were, um, I thought, well, who are these people writing these letters? So, you know, the Republicans have their database of all the voters in the state and the Democrats have their database of all the voters in the state. We get it from the Wisconsin Elections Commission. So, it, and it's updated near election day, it's updated almost every day. So I thought, well, I'll type in the names, you know, see who these people are. They don't exist. They, people made up names and submitted these poison pen letters to the editor. Um, and so I sent a message to the, the opinion page editor and said, these people don't exist anywhere in the state of Wisconsin. And so he checked, um, and to the Tribune's credit, they pulled the letters and they have uh, an article in today saying, from now on, anybody who submits letters, we're going to check. We're going to make sure that they exist. We're going to make sure that they live where they say they live and who they are. And I think that is a good development because, again, people running for local office do so because they feel an obligation to do something for their community. These, by and large, are not partisans. These are people that you know, they have better things to do with their life, but just like the League of Women Voters, it's like, well, I want to do something to make my community a little bit better. And we shouldn't attack them. We should thank them for running. And we should go back to the days, I don't know when those days were, but back to the days where you voted for somebody instead of against somebody. I mean, that, that is a trend that I would like to see change because it's just, they're getting nastier and, and nastier. Um, so that's my soapbox today. Sorry about that. Um, I want to talk about one, I had a couple bills passed this session that I was pretty excited about. Some coming out of the um, very exciting Uniform Death Reporting Study Committee. Um, it actually, it, it really was interesting. Um, one of the things that we learned was on, on death certificates that the, the coroner or the medical examiner could only list like two, no, one occupation. So if you have a farmer who died from cancer, who was also, say, a truck driver, you, for, for learning about trends, like why are farmers getting this kind of cancer, it might say, well, his primary job was a truck driver, and not pick up the fact that this farmer was also, this person was also a farmer, and was exposed to chemicals and so forth. And so something as simple as adding another line on the death certificate so that we could find out, well, what are the other things about this person? So there's a lot of interesting things. Um, and so those bills um, passed uh, during the flurry of bills that, that passed over the last month of, of session. Uh, then one uh, that I'm very excited about, given my Irish heritage, uh, we. Uh, we're over in Ireland. I was with the Speaker Voss and a delegation from Wisconsin. We met with the, uh, the governments of both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Um, and they, Mark Daly, the President of the Senate in the Republic of Ireland, said, we should create a trade council between Ireland and Wisconsin 
so that we can improve the, you know, the, the exchange of products going back and forth. And uh, I thought that sounded like a pretty cool idea. I talked to uh, Speaker Voss and said, can we do this? And he said, I think that's a great idea, and I'll even put you on as the second author. Not the first author, but the second author, that's fine. Um, and so that passed, and two days ago, the governor signed that bill, creating the Trade Council. Um, so the, the state senate gets, I think, three appointments to the Trade Council, the state assembly gets three appointments, the governor gets three appointments, some are kind of designated who they have to be, but then there's one that uh, one of the positions can be you know, a person interested in Irish trade. And I'm thinking, I'm interested in Irish trade. And I wouldn't mind if I had to go to do further exploration um, to, to check it out. So I, I'll submit my name. Um, and I'm getting the, uh, the this from Ellen. So I'm going to uh, wrap up my, my comments at this point. But like Jill, I'll uh, hang around for any questions that you may have. Thank you. And Representative Lauren Oldenburg, welcome. Thank you very much. We let the long-winded speakers go first, so I'll, you know, I said I can keep it in five minutes. Um, yes, I'm Lauren Oldenburg. I represent the 96th District. I live just outside of Chaseburg, so I'm roughly 25 minutes away from here. I uh, live on my uh, family farm. has been in my family for almost 150 years. Well, well, Steve started with the maps. I'll start with the maps. Currently, I represent Vernon County, Crawford County, and Monroe County. And about four to five weeks ago, the governor signed them his maps that he presented to us legislators. We passed it out to the legislator, and he did sign that, his maps. Um, now I include all of Vernon County except the <clears throat> village of Iola and DeSoto. And now I come up here in La Crosse County, uh, Cro uh, Greenfield, Town of Shelby, and the southern half of the city of La Crosse. I mean, Jill and I. She just can walk maybe 30 seconds and get into the 96th district. Um, so I got everything pretty much south of 33, hit 12th Avenue. I got west of 12th Avenue, um, across Cass Street in the Pettibone. I always say they want to get rid of me so bad they sent me all the way to Minnesota. So almost there, you know. So and then he, uh, Steve brought up John Menninger. I'm actually related to him. So maybe he'll vote for his relations. So. So we'll see. I'll have to kind of twist his arm a little bit. So, um, yeah, we're pretty much done with legislation as far as that goes. Uh, some great things that got done through the budget process, uh, shared revenue back to local municipalities, um, personal property taxes got taken out of the, through the budget process, um, all good things so local municipalities can actually uh, run their uh, government and do very well at it and stuff like that. I've happened the uh, last few weeks go to the town of Greenfield, the town of Shelby, and uh, board meetings in the city of La Crosse City Council a week ago Thursday. And I was still, just telling uh, Senator Half there, it's like I came out of there, that gave me more anxiety than what my job does. I mean, it's just, because they have the hard, hardest job out there. I mean, because they are the closest to the people. And through the shared revenue that we uh, funded through the budget, uh, so they can. We gave them more dollars and continue to give more dollars because it's tied to uh, the personal or tied to the sales tax. One percent of the sales tax going forward, so sales tax revenue keeps going up in the state of Wisconsin. Local government officials will actually have more dollars to do their jobs. Um, so, so a little few things uh, that I am proud of that got done um, either through the budget or on uh, in separate bills. Number one, um, youth apprenticeship. I've been an advocate since I got down there in 2019 to fund youth apprenticeship. Um, this last, in the last budget, we put almost $7 million more dollars in youth apprenticeship. There's 9,000 kids that actually participate in youth apprenticeship in the state of Wisconsin, and it continues to grow. I think that number was 5,000 when I started in 2019. It's at 9,000 now, and, we, and through this budget, we funded it at full value um, so the schools get reimbursed and the kids are able to get out and start their careers early at a low possibility of uh, little or no student debt loan going forward, uh, and they find their career path quicker and sooner. Um, in the bill process, I did get uh, farmland preservation credits up to $10 an acre, try to get more farmers or landowners doing good conservation practices. Um, and that was the idea of the bill, 
because we did a survey back in 2017 or earlier that farmers or landowners didn't want to get involved in farmland preservation because the the dollars was not incentivized enough to actually get landowners and farmers to uh, participate. And one is a very simple bill, and this is how legislation should work. My sheriff of Vernon County came to me and says, hey, Florida has emergency contact information on their license. It's not in your physical license, but it's on the backside when they, they run the information. Can we do something like that in the state of Wisconsin? Because Wisconsin didn't have it. So he came and we wrote legislation, worked with the DOT, how it should look. We started last session toward the end, didn't get it done. This session we got it, started early, and the governor signed that into law in December 6th, I believe, this year. Um, that's how legislation is supposed to work. You guys have ideas, you bring it to us, and uh, we vet it. We have ledge council that looks at it, say, hey, okay, yeah, it works. We copy a lot of what other states do, so it makes it easier. And that's, uh, I'm very proud of that legislation as far as getting done. So it'll affect your chance when you renew your license and go on there. It's, it's optional. You can put your contact information. And so in case you need it in an accident throughout the country, if you're driving, they can pull that up. And, you know, your next, your contact person will be contacted sooner and quicker. So you will not have to cut me off. I'll cut you off myself. And um, I'll turn it over to you. And definitely uh, love to have questions later. Thank you. I, I think Brad is behind the column here. So, Senator Paff, and you know, 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all. Seems like anytime you turn on the TV, the world can be, seem like a pretty scary place. And I don't know about you, but sometimes all I want to do is just put the covers back over my head, and go back to sleep. But you didn't do that. We didn't do that. We showed up. We showed up here this morning. On behalf of all my colleagues, let me be the first to say thank you. Thank you for doing that. I am Brad Paff, and I want to share with you this morning a place that I love, a place that we call home, the Cooley region. God's country. You see, this is the place in which I grew up. It's where I met my wife, Betty. It's where my wife, Betty, and I raised our two children. My family's been farming in this area since they first came to this country in the mid-1800s. Since that time, five generations have called this area home. I love this area. And who knows, God willing, Maybe just someday, Betty and I will have some grandkids that will be grow up in this area and run in those rolling hills just like I did. But as much as I love this area, I know there's a lot more work that needs to be done. I know that it's not always easy in order to make it in this area. You see, the people in this area, we work hard. Parents whose mornings begin at the crack of dawn, and quite frankly, the work day doesn't end until they tuck their kids in bed at night. Got people, friends, they work with their hands. They weld steel. They drive truck. They take care of our loved ones. They milk our cows. They plow the fields. These people are the backbones of our communities. These are the people that I come from. These are the people I am proud to stand for. That's why the last four years, it's been a real honor to represent all of you in the Wisconsin State Senate. But we got a lot more work to do. And that's why I stand before you. You see, the people in this area are hardworking. They're honest. They're resilient. They put in a hard day's work, and all they seek is some honest pay. But I'll tell you this. I don't believe in Madison. We're living up to the end of the bargain. I believe 
there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And how do I know? Look at the condition of our roads. Yes, there's been investments been put in this, but more needs to be done. You need childcare? Good luck finding a slot for your kid, and good luck finding it at an affordable rate. Cost of prescriptions. I think we all know they're too high. What about grocery prices? Gas prices? Let's be honest. People need a break. More work needs to be done. I think, and this is what I've tried to do and I will continue to do, is I want to make sure the voices here in western Wisconsin are heard in that state capitol. And I want to make sure that in that state capitol, in the state senate, that they know, my colleagues know, there's an advocate for the people here in the Driftless region. I think it's long past time that we expand Badger Care so people in this region and around the state can get access to the health care that they deserve. I think it's long past time that we put aside the partisan differences and we get busy on reinvesting in manufacturing and technology. Because quite frankly, I want to make sure that we grow this economy from the bottom up, from the middle out, but I want to make sure that we have jobs here. That is important. I want to cap the price of insulin. My son is a type 1 diabetic. He's 23 years old. He's hardworking, but he has a pre existing condition. And I think it's long past time, these politicians, Madison, that we get together and we do hold these pharmaceutical companies accountable. I think we have to lower the price of prescription drugs. I think it's long past time that we do that. I've had legislation to have price transparency, to have prescription drug oversight boards. It goes nowhere. But I'm going to continue to advocate to make sure that we do this because it needs to be done. I want to make sure in Wisconsin that our state government has a buy Wisconsin provision. Because I want to make sure that the products that our state buys come from Wisconsin workers, made in Wisconsin factories, in Wisconsin communities. Because I think it's only right that the profits stay here in Wisconsin with our Wisconsin workers in our Wisconsin communities reinvesting in our state's economy. And I want to make sure, and I will not stop, until we make sure that we codify Roe v. Way into state law. We cannot have a situation in which an 1849 law is still on the books. I will fight like hell to make sure that a woman has a right to choose. I think that is something that is basic and it needs to be done. Now, if you listen to some of these politicians, sounds pretty scary. The world's going to heck. But it doesn't have to be like that. We don't need all the anger, all the finger pointing, all the divisiveness. That may capture some of the headlines. In fact, it captures too many of the headlines. But that isn't who I am. You know me. You can call me old fashioned, but I still believe in the fact that we can get together. We can find common ground. We can build consensus. We can do this the Western Wisconsin way. We can do it. And we need to do it. But that means we need to get back to the basics. That means to get back to listening and learning from one another and recognizing that there's more that unites us than divides us. That's what I believe. Those are my values. Those are the values that I learned on the family farm in Northern La Crosse County. Those are the values I heard from my uncles and my aunts when we were at the family reunion. Those are the values 
that the people out here that we interact with every single day, that's what they're asking their legislators to do. They're not asking us to chase the headlines. They're not asking us to turn up the volume and take everything on. They want us to listen. They want us to share with them who we are, what we're all about, and once elected, what we're going to do. It's an honor to represent you in the Wisconsin State Senate. I will continue to bring your voice to the State Senate every single day. I know where I'm from. And my request to you is this. Let's work together to make sure that we continue to move this area, the Cooley region, God's country. Let's move it forward. Thank you. I look forward to taking your questions. I'm just going to digress for a minute and answer Brad's question with about wanting to get up this morning and not putting the blankets over your head again. For those of you who stayed up to watch the end of the Badger game and see them implode last night, you know that that's kind of what I thought of first as I got up this morning. Oh, anyway. <laughs> it, was, it was, anyway, nothing went right. Um, come on back. There, there are two mics here that you can use to pass back and forth. We are on a Zoom, so it helps to have you do that. I'm going to start a question by just asking, when the heck is the PFAS thing going to be resolved for our part of the state and elsewhere? You want to go ahead? Sure. Um, well, so Senator Wimberger had a bill, um, and there were some good parts in it. But there were also some things that we just couldn't get um, on board with. The governor, in fact, uh, has recently talked about holding polluters accountable. And he thought that was an important part that was missing from that bill. Um, in response, Senator Paff and I authored a bill. Oh, we were putting fine tuning on that. Like one night, one of our last nights of session, we were at 11 o'clock at night. I was in our leader's office with my staff, who's brilliant on these issues. And we were talking about, um, about the details of, of a bill that we put out that we think is better, um, but you know we're late in the session. But it, it gives us a starting point for next time around. Uh, we ran everything by Lee Donahue. I don't know if many of you know her out on French Island. Anytime there's bill or legislation that comes in front of me, I always check with her because she is the local expert. That she's on the town board in Campbell, and she knows she's done so much research. She's a great advocate. Um, so we put the bill out. We um, and we'll have to wait till, unfortunately, wait till next session to get anything done legislatively. Is there anything you want to add? Uh, thank you, Joe. Yes, uh, the PFAS bill went, actually went through my committee. I'm chair of the environmental committee. And uh, as introduced, it got amended to try to get everyone on board. Um, got to about 95%. Biggest thing difference um, from where manufacturing and municipalities will not go is the, the innocent landowner part of it. And what does that understand? I'm going to go with the farming aspect because that's what I do. And a lot of municipalities uh, actually spread their uh, solid waste on farmland. So if that was PFAS contaminated, say farmer A was there um, and found out he has PFAS, so farmer B sits right next to it, no fault of his own, then farmer C sits over here. So that PFAS had to travel all the way to farmer C. Technically, within this bill that we, tech, we protect the far, innocent landowner, if we don't have that in there, Farmer C could actually sue Farmer B, and he had no responsibility for his contamination. And so that's where it's, we're 95% there. Um, I truly believe the governor should sign this bill, get the money out there. It's $125 million. Get the start of these municipalities in it and these private well owners that have a problem that they can actually get grant money to start mitigating this issue. And so let's do this. If we have to come back and do something else next year, 
we can sure well do it. But the money's there. Why wait and not spend this $125 million? Because this argument will start again in 20, January 25, and we'll go through the whole process, and we'll be back here in 2026 without getting nothing done. We have it there. We amended it, brought everyone to the table, and it's there. Let's get it done. Let's just take a step back and let's recognize what, what we have here. We got hundreds of our neighbors in the town of Campbell that for nearly four years have been drinking bottled water because the water that comes out of their tap has, is contaminated with a forever chemical. So let's just level set that. Through no fault of their own, they've got PFAS in their water. They have sought remediation and help. In order to move forward with this, we have to have a PFAS standard in the state of Wisconsin. We don't have it. So as Representative Billings stated, we've introduced legislation to establish a PFAS standard. How, what would that PFAS level be? It would be part of a ground water standard. I want to be clear with you. We drinking water standards in Wisconsin that municipal water systems have to follow. We have surface water standards in Wisconsin for lakes, rivers, and streams. But we do not have a ground water standard. And for those of us that come from the country, country and have private, grew up on private wells, or if you live in the town of Campbell, and you have a private well, you have to have a groundwater standard. We don't have it, but Minnesota does. And as the bird flies from the town of Campbell to Minnesota, is less than two miles, but yet we don't have it. We can't get that legislation through. Why? Because there's a fear that the DNR would overexceed its authority. So yes, the legislature approved, Joint Finance is sitting, 16 members, Joint Finance is sitting with $125 million that could go out to provide assistance for monitoring, for monitoring wells, for removal. We don't know at what, to what standard to remove, but for removal, there's $125 million sitting there. But the 16 members of the Joint Finance Committee will not release this money. Why? They say there's no standard. There's no standard because they won't establish a standard. It will not permit the authorization of a standard. Representative Billings and I have introduced this legislation to do that. We're still not there. So yes, there was legislation that brought forward that would move forward, help create some clarity here. There was some concerns that were raised regarding innocent landowners. Completely agree. Innocent landowners, through no fault of their own, if they have PFAS put on their property, should not be subject and liable. Completely agree. However, there are those that have made PFAS, that have added PFAS to products. May it be fast food wrappers, may it be carpets, should the state of Wisconsin taxpayers pay for all this cleanup, or is there others? That is the question that the governor asked in his veto, and he wants clarity on that. In the meantime, with Representative Billings and others, I've moved legislation, I've introduced legislation that calls for the eventual banning of PFAS in products. Other states have done this. Private companies are moving forward with this. Uh, fast food companies have moved forward to try and eliminate PFAS from any of their products that they are selling, as has grocery stores and, uh, and others, retailers. 
the legislation that we have would take it for uh, products that contain PFAS would not be sold in Wisconsin after I believe 2034 or 2036. So it's an eventual, it's a phase in, but it's an effort to move forward here because we have to do something. The residents in the town of Campbell, far too many of them, for over three years, nearly four years, have been drinking bottled water. They cannot wait any longer. We should not have to wait any longer. We as a state should be able to establish groundwater standards. We should be able as a state to recognize the fact that 16 members of the Joint Finance Committee should no longer hold up this $125 million, get this money out here, Let's make sure that at least there's some testing and removal. But we're no further ahead today than we were six months ago. And I think that's unfortunate. And I will continue uh, to push and to advocate um, because I think the people of the town of Campbell deserve better than having bottled water and having a legislature that uh, you know cannot see to the fact that they can't even take the 125 million that they've already approved, that we've already approved, and get it back here, at least for some um, immediate uh, remediation assistance until we move forward on establishing these standards and removing PFAS uh, as additives uh, to any of the products that are being sold. I have just a quick observation. This is a perfect example of what's wrong with how government works these days. We are adjourned for the year and we're still in March. There are Democrats whose wells are contaminated. There are Republicans whose wells are contaminated. Why don't we have a special session and get this resolved? I get paid till the end of December, actually into the first couple of days of January, but I'm not going into session because we're not in session anymore. It would just seem so obvious that that's what we need to do is force people, lock them in a room, solve the problem and move on. Maybe I'm naive, I don't know. Well, <laughs> um, questions from the group. And, I'm just, and then I'll sit down and you people can discuss as appropriate and just remember to repeat the question in case. Any other questions from the group? I'm in that light, so excuse me. Oh, okay, Betty? So her question is that she had seen that a bill proposed that was, in her opinion, quite undemocratic because it asked citizens to give up their right to petition for uh, non-binding resolutions, which is what we have here in Wisconsin. Comments? Oh, I'll, I'll take that one first. Um, being on the county board, we're the bad guys. We're the ones that made the state want to change the rules because we put questions on the ballot uh, that were advisory referendums like, um, issues of legalization of marijuana, abortion, and, and so forth, just so that the state legislature that refused to talk about those issues could hear what the people out in the, the state had to say. So we, the county board, and we've done it for years, or have done it for years, uh, would put those on and people would, would uh, express their opinion, and the state didn't want to hear it anymore, so they're now not allowing us to do it. Um, I absolutely 100% voted against that, um, but unfortunately that's the law right now. And it's very undemocratic. I agree with you. I also agree with you. I, I voted against that too. Um, I think it's important to hear on the grassroots level uh, from folks. I, I mean, I would guess, and, and maybe Lauren wants to talk about this a little more, I would guess that the reason why some people would have voted for that legislation is that they feel that sometimes, sometimes that's used Referendums are used as a way to try to manipulate the vote and draw out either Republican-leaning or Democratically-leaning voters. And so I think some people in the majority didn't like that. That that would be my guess, and Lauren can talk about this more, but I agree. First, I want to clarify, and I think, Jill, did you vote for the shared revenue bill? Right. Steve, you voted for it? No, I didn't say that. I think it was just 
It actually was part of the shared revenue bill. It was part of a whole big package. It was a huge bill. And that's where it was part of the negotiation to get, you know, with the governor and shared revenue. The idea was that because it roughly, Steve can probably verify five to seven thousand dollars to actually put a referendum on a bat local ballot that costs the county, correct? A little bit less than that. So the idea to give more money to the share uh, to the local municipalities, um, that was okay. We're going to do that, but why spend the money on visor referendums? That was kind of the thought and process from the leadership from the Republicans. Um, the idea is, you know, Zuckerberg sent, spent $400 million across the country uh, last year, um, and most of that money actually went to Democratic-run cities. And uh, so up to 2020, it's up to the local municipalities to actually fund and run local elections. Why do you need outside money to run local or run elections because it's the responsibilities of local municipalities to fund it and to run it and make sure it's run correctly. And I truly believe all elections are run correctly. You know, you locked, you know, it is a lot of stress, a lot of work to actually run elections. And they are under a lot of scrutiny. You know, a lot of eyes are looking at them, both sides. But we got to support them municipality-wise. Why do we need all some money to run these elections? We don't. We never needed it before. Why did we need them in 2020? And there is no evidence or no data or where was that money actually spent. I don't know. You don't know. Why do we actually need it? You know, they're written... Oh, they're just at, he's just asking about the two amendments. They're pretty much tied, you know, to together. You know, they're written so lawyer like Steve's probably the only one who can understand most of it and stuff. So, but that's kind of what the, the reasoning behind those amendments. Um, if they were written lawyerly, they were written by Republican lawyers <laughs> so that you wouldn't understand them. So the answer, the question Lauren asked about, well, why do we need, um, people other than the governments to run the elections when that's their responsibility. Why were you people there helping out at this last election? I mean, apparently we don't need you. I, I, I don't agree with that at all. If we can do a, a, a situation where people come in and help for free to, you know, alphabetize the return envelopes for, for the ballots and, and things like that, that saves taxpayer dollars. And it makes us feel good when we're doing that, helping out our local officials. So uh, to me, um, I, I do have a concern with the wording of the, the referendum because you read it and you think, well, that makes sense. But when you really understand what it means, it doesn't make sense, except if you're trying to make it more difficult to, for local governments to run their elections. I'll just real briefly add on that. This is another example where we're looking backwards. We're still talking about 2020. We got a presidential election, a election for all of the state assembly, half of the state senate. We got congressional elections, a U.S. Senate election taking place here in eight months, less than eight months, but yet we're still looking backwards to 2020. I just think that we can do better. It's just, it's just an example of the fact that continuing to look backwards rather than looking forward. And um, that is just not what we should be doing. So thank you. I'll just say finally, I, I believe that these, the referendum items along with a lot of the legislation that the governor just vetoed, the purpose of it was to really sow seeds of doubt in our election. And um, we have good, fair elections in Wisconsin. And um, I, fight against all those efforts to sow those seeds of fear. Other questions? I, we have 
about five minutes left for our state folks. I'm going to run the mic back. When will the legislature look at the broken mental health care laws in Wisconsin and support greater access for those in need? I think when we have new faces. I think Governor Evers uh, named 2023 the year of, of good mental health and focused in on that. I serve on a task force for children's mental health. And I think that slowly we're, um, we're doing better things. We're collecting information from kids, from people who work with kids, from uh, practitioners, from teachers, from all over. We've got like four different subgroups of people. Republicans and Democrats um, in leadership are sitting on those subcommittees. And so we're um, trying to do better. I think we're gathering the information that we need. What came out of the COVID, the terrible you know, COVID epidemic, and how do we help kids move forward? So that's one part, the kid part. Um, and we've had proposals, but um, you know, I think, honestly, I, th I think we need new faces. I know that you're a great advocate on this, Sheila. Thank you um, for your work. And I am hopeful, I'm hopeful in the future because we have to, we have to address this. Well, I agree. I agree with the representative. We do need to have um, greater attention that's brought forward and we need to have advocates and we need to have champions. Uh, let me just share real quickly. Some of you may know or may not know, but um, I served for a period of time as Wisconsin Secretary of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection. Governor Evers appointed me to that position in, when he was elected in 2018. And he asked me to travel the state, and listen to learn from our family farmers, and I did. I traveled this state. I heard directly from our family farmers and rural residents what was taking place out in the countryside. And once I started to really listen, it didn't matter what side of the political aisle I was on or they were on, they would start sharing their concerns. And I started to hear the anxiousness and the anxiety, and just the real depression uh, from many of our rural residents about what was happening and the need for greater mental health funding. And I'd bring that back. And I'd share that with the governor and our team at the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture. And we had a program. We have, a, we have something in our state for farmer mental health. But there wasn't the funding there for it. And uh, I spoke up. I spoke up probably too loud in behalf of farmer mental health. And um, make a long story short, then Majority Leader Scott Fitzgerald in the Wisconsin State Senate said, we've heard enough from you, PAF. We're not going to confirm you as Secretary of Agriculture. And on a straight party line vote, I was rejected as Secretary of Agriculture for the state of Wisconsin because I had the audacity to speak up for farmer mental health. I tell you that story for the simple reason that uh, you got to have people speak up. And they have to be able to share their story of what's happening. Because this is not a red or blue issue. This is not a rural or urban issue. This is an issue that needs to be addressed. And it impacts all demographics and all different ways of life. And so I agree with Representative Billings. I think we need new leadership. I think we need to make sure that we have strong advocates that will speak up on behalf of what's happening out here. And I think that we need to recognize the fact that um, it's, we can't just push this aside. We have to great, bring greater attention, have wraparound services, and uh, to focus. And uh, as I stated before, um, I had no idea that my brief time as Wisconsin Secretary of Agriculture, that it would be defined on the fact that I stood up for farmer mental health. But I just want to let you know that um, it is an important issue, and it's an important issue for the people of this area and this state, and I thank you for your work. 
And, <laughs> and uh, we are at 10 o'clock, and I had a question from uh, one of our members that I'm going to read quickly, and if you can address quickly, and then we'll move to uh, Greg and Mary, who came in. Um, do you think that the state should continue passing legislation that limits local control? Things like uh, shoreline zoning, restricting boat wakes. Um, he has established a home rule, and this seems contradictory, putting more power in the state legislature versus local governments. Are we going the right way or the wrong way? We're going the wrong way. Um, there was a time that the Republican Party was known as the, the party of local control, but that has certainly changed. I guess any party, once they're you know, in control, wants to kind of make all the rules, and, and so that's what we've seen. Um, as a person who has been involved in local government for decades, um, I have seen that erosion of, of local control. In fact, it, it's even worse than taking away local control. The state gives us extra responsibilities to, to do um, and then tells us how to do it and doesn't give us the money to do it. So not only do we lose control over the decisions that we're making, we're also losing control over the money and how we spend it at, at the local level. And I, I think it was Lauren made the comment about, you know, the, the people who are at the local level, they're the ones who are making important decisions. They're the ones you run into in the grocery store and at the post office and so forth. And I think that we should give greater uh, authority to local governments because what's good for La Crosse or on Alaska may not be good for Manaqua or Milwaukee. Uh, and, and so things should be allowed to be different across the state. So I think it's a bad trend and I think it's unfortunately not likely to change for a while. Um, 100% agree. I mean, the problem is we all run now in competitive seats. Uh, we, you know, Jill's going to be new to the competitive seat. You know, as far as, you know, us three have run in competitive seats and won. The problem is down there in leadership, especially, you know, what I've been in the majority is uh, legislation is that there are a lot of people that don't run in competitive seats and they think they can do anything and everything and it kind of gets shoved down you know, and stuff. But, but Steve is right, you know, you get mandated, no money comes with it. And as a former town board chair and a supervisor, we have a lot of hard decisions to make in a very small board to do it. And when we're told to do those things, it just adds burdensome onto us. Um, I mean, there's certain things that affect the statewide thing, you know, the, uh, Great Lakes shore as far as uh, erosion and stuff like that. Sometimes those are easier things to do in a broad perspective instead of having cookie cutter ways of dealing with those. So, but I'm definitely local control. Um, it's where it needs to be. I uh, met with, um, well, Jill and Brad was there at the uh, CESA 4 and a comment came up there, should the state legislature pass a legislation to actually uh, get rid of make sure cell phones are not allowed in schools while they're in school. And I said, you guys can do that at home. Why make us do those decisions? You know, we need local boards and school boards to actually make those tough decisions. Don't look for us, make them at the local level because every local level is different. I agree with Lauren. Um, but I also want to say one of the best compliments I ever received in my political career was from Joe Heim, who said, Jill, you run your, your races like you've got someone nipping at your heels, like you're in a competitive race. Because I, I, like the, I like that part of it. I like knocking on doors and talking to folks and hearing what people in my community need. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be different, but it will be, um, luckily I enjoy the work. Um, so, and also I have eight years on the county board before I got elected to the state assembly. So I am a believer in local control. Thank you. And thank to all, thanks to all of you for coming today and our audience for participating. This is always an event I personally look forward to every year and I'm sure that's true of most of you in the room. Thanks, You're very welcome. So next up are two representatives from our federal folks. Um, Mary Carney, who's here for Representative, Representative Ann Ort, Greg Wawrink, who's here for Senator Baldwin. I'll start with Mary for 10 minutes, and then Greg and 
We're going to wrap uh, up then at about 1030 with the presentations. There should be two operating mics up here. So there's one here, and I guess I'll keep this for questions. OK. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm not sure if I can fill up a whole 10 minutes, but <laughs> um, we'll just see how it goes. Um, and last year when I was with you, I kind of, I just read through some talking points um, that our communications person um, presented. So um, this year I'm gonna just kind of go from my experience and the experience of the congressman for his first year in office. So uh, as I explained last year, um, we are very district heavy with staff. Um, we have a, a huge constituent services department that helps with every federal agency. Um, and this past year, we have helped get third district constituents over $1.1 million back in their pockets that from the VA, from Social Security, from the IRS. In fact, I have a funny story. There's one fellow who fought the IRS over $4 because he knew he had done his math correctly and he fought and he fought and he fought and he finally got that $4 check back this past week. So that was one little win, um, but it's more the principle of it. Um, we've also just recently helped a World War II veteran get the medals that he deserved. Um, so that hasn't quite made public yet, um, but we're very excited about that. Uh, so we have a full-time VA person who helps just our veterans um, get the services that they deserve. Uh, we have a full-time Social Security person, Medicare person, uh, State Department person that helps with passports. Um, and we're all based in the Eau Claire office and our La Crosse office here. So out of our um, employees that uh, the Congressman has selected, they, we have 11 here in district and we have seven in DC. So he really wanted to make a point of offering services and accessibility uh, to the constituents of the third district. Um, in other news, he's just recently voted to approve the um, funding the government. So that just went through yesterday. And uh, it includes the Dickey Amendment, which ensures that federal funds cannot be used to advocate for or promote gun control, uh, reaffirms US commitment to Israel, and fully funds our annual security agreement. It funds the largest increase in basic military pay for all service members in over 20 years. Uh, it fully funds the SOCOM's operation and maintenance requirements, provides funds to hire 22,000 border patrol agents, and provides funds to the National Institute of Health Institutes and Centers, which fully supports basic biomedical research investigating cures for cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and other chronic and rare diseases. So he was proud to support that bill. Um, more locally, uh, he has been able to acquire over $26 million for the third district for particular projects. Um, these include 10 million for the Eau Claire County to reconstruct County Road T in the Chippewa Valley Corridor. Uh, 3.6 million, actually 3.7 million, for Portage County solid waste to purchase and install sorting equipment for Portage County's material recovery facility. 2.5 million for the city of Richland Center to extend infrastructure to serve the site of a new hospital, including water and sewer infrastructure. 2 million for Eau Claire to filter PFAS from the drinking water. 2 million for the town of Campbell to establish a new municipal water system. 1.4 million for the River, Fa River Falls to renovate the River Falls Fire Department. 1.1 million for the city of Lancaster to renovate the Lancaster Fire Station. 1 million for the village of Lafarge to relocate an electrical substation and infrastructure to higher ground. Apparently they've been in a flood zone. Uh, I talked to the uh, the utilities um, person who said that a few years ago with the flooding, they literally had to go out there in waist deep water to shut off the power switch for Lafarge. So as terrifying as it was, luckily nobody was hurt. Um, but now we'll remediate that by moving the substation to higher ground. Um, we've also uh, 
allotted uh, 951,000 for Monroe County to extend their infrastructure for the next full cell construction at the Monroe County landfill, 800,000 for the Lake Altoona Rehabilitation and Protection District to refurbish and install a Bedlow sediment collector system into the Eau Claire River, 600,000 for the Gunderson Health System to purchase ambulances and other emergency equipment that will be used in Hillsboro predominantly um, and uh, yeah, and to purchase a new ambulance for the for more of the rural health needs that we have. Uh, 500,000 for Portage County to replace analog and security cameras and storage for Portage County buildings. 250,000 for the Agricultural Research Service to conduct cranberry research and $100,000 for the Chippewa County Sheriff's Office to improve emergency communications. Uh, the Congressman sits on three committees, um, which are all represented in, um, in these funds. So he's on the VA committee, of course, and he's a subcommittee chair um, that helps veterans in that window of time where they are most vulnerable for mental health issues. So it's the day they get out of service to the day they enter the workforce. So he is a very strong proponent, proponent of mental health for our veterans, for our farmers, and especially uh, for our youth as well. So in fact, he had me meet with a CISO4 um, psychologist uh, just recently um, just to talk about what's going on in our schools, how we can help our students with mental health issues and trying try and figure that out. So it's, we're starting that conversation. And uh, that's something that's very near and dear to his heart and just in helping especially service members who um, do have a high rate of suicide, unfortunately. Um, he's also on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Uh, so he's been working hard to improve railway safety. Um, in fact, he put forth a bill that was passed to uh, ha um, have additional funds allotted for inspections across the country. Um, and then he's also on, let's see, agriculture, of course. So he's been working with our local farmers. Um, he put together, uh, he actually had the agricultural secretary come to Wisconsin um, and meet with our, um, a lot of our farmers from every county uh, that he represents. Um, so. He's been working hard in DC. He comes back um, most weekends uh, just to meet with constituents. Um, and again, our office is always available um, for any assistance that we can provide for constituent services in any federal agency. So thank you again for having me. And Greg is here representing Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Greg. Well, good morning and uh, good to be back here uh, at, at this uh, annual breakfast event. Uh, first off, just want to thank uh, the League of Women Voters for uh, all outstanding work you do all year long and um, just uh, remaining engaged in, in civic organizations like this. Um, want to just quickly got some prepared remarks uh, uh, and then uh, happy to listen to folks. However, I'm not in a position to be able to answer any questions today, um, but like I said, uh, happy to Take back whatever uh, comments you want me to to uh, the senator who unfortunately apologizes that uh, she can't be here uh, this morning. Uh, to just go over some committee assignments that uh, Senator Baldwin's a part of, uh, she's on the Appropriations Committee and, and with that also serves as the chair of the subcommittee on Labor, Health and Human Services, Education and Related Agencies. Um, then she also serves on the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, also known as HELP, and then also on the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee, uh, serving as the chair for the Oceans, Fisheries, Climate Change, and Manufacturing uh, Subcommittee. Um, I do encourage you, whenever, if you're ever looking for information, uh, uh, www.baldwin.senate.gov um, is a great resource. Uh, you always can find the uh, latest bills and, uh, bill, and news and bill introductions. You can also sign up for personalized email updates, uh, picking the, uh, the, 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 the issues that matter to you that you want to hear updates on. Uh, Mary touched upon it, but we too also have a constituent casework team that's uh, ready and able to assist whenever dealing with a federal agency. And our office also uh, may be able to help coordinate if you're ever 
uh, going out to D.C. Uh, or any family that you know of or friends um, to coordinate uh, trips, uh, whether White House, Congress, Lo uh, Capitol, Library of Congress, and Supreme Court. So uh, all that can be found on our website or uh, reach out. I'm in the La Crosse office uh, on the second floor of the Social Security Building, just as uh, Representative Van Orden's office is. So a one-stop shop uh, for your federal needs here in La Crosse. I'm going to touch upon some of the 2023 uh, accomplishment highlights for Senator Baldwin. Um, she's always been a long pusher for Build America, Buy America infrastructure. Uh, she worked to ensure that the Biden administration uh, boost the use of American-made goods and infrastructure projects, adhering to standards that she successfully fought to include in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, Buy America efforts continue, uh, and just earlier this month, the Federal Highway uh, Administration ended a 40 year waiver and has put in place now stronger by America standards that support our American manufacturing. Uh, another issue uh, near and dear to her heart is uh, lowering the cost of prescription drugs as well as in increasing transparency uh, for drug prices. Uh, Senator Baldwin's bipartisan Fair Accountability and Innovative Research Drug Pricing Act uh, passed out of the Senate Health Committee last year with both Democrat and Republican support. Uh, this bill is just something that would require basic transparency uh, for those uh, with for skyrocketing drug prices. Uh, the Baldwin-backed Inflation Reduction Act allows Medicare to negotiate the price of dozens of drugs with manufacturers for the first time ever. So not only does this co cut the cost for out-of-pocket prices uh, for seniors, but it also saves American taxpayers billions of dollars, helping reduce the deficit. Also, the Inflation Reduction Act has a $35 cap now on out-of-pocket costs for insulins for senior on Medicare, and efforts continue to make that for everybody. The work also continues uh, in this uh, realm. As Senator Baldwin and some of her help committee colleagues launched an investigation at the start of this year um, into the extremely high cost of inhalers. Uh, inhaler companies charge anywhere from $200 to $600 for one single inhaler for what costs many in other countries under $10. Uh, coincidentally, maybe, uh, but since the launch of this investigation, three of the four major manufacturers, two of so this week actually, have come out to say that they will now cap the cost of inhalers at $35. So right there, action that we're instantly seeing that now will benefit around a half a million Wisconsinites who deal with asthma. So uh, very exciting that uh, just in a few months' time, uh, that investigation created those results. Um, another highlight of 2023 is bringing home a regional technology hub here in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, this was uh, announced in October, uh, designated by the Biden administration as a regional technology hub. And this was an initiative that was created uh, from the Baldwin-supported Chips and Science Act. Uh, planning uh, currently now taking place amongst the stakeholders across the state for this Wisconsin BioHealth Tech Hub, which will work to position Wisconsin as a global leader in personalized medicine. Also, um, her bipartisan legislation connecting veterans uh, with their earned benefits passed through the Senate. Um, this uh, piece of legislation is the Veterans Support and Outreach Act. Uh, this passed the Senate unanimously back in November, and this would expand the support uh, that the federal government would help with both tribal and county veteran service officers. Uh, looking now uh, to this year in the 2024 uh, FY24 budget is just about complete finally. Uh, the first uh, six of 12 appropriation bills were signed into law at the start of this month. And work on the remaining six, I'm glad to report, is wrapping up here. Uh, the Senate voted around 2 a.m. this morning, uh, passed 74-24. Uh, so those were the remaining six, and that sends the bill now to President Biden, which I'm sure will be signed here today. Uh, passage of the budget also includes the congressionally directed spending request that local governments and nonprofits uh, apply to our office with. Uh, Mary touched on uh, the projects that uh, Representative Van Orden uh, supported. Uh, some of the FY24 projects that Senator Baldwin supported included $1 million for the La Crosse County Hillview Community Services Center. Um, she mentioned, uh, uh, and a lot of these are some joint projects, so we were on board as well with the Monroe County uh, 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 congressionally directed spending request. Um, also, 
Uh, the town of Farmington will be receiving 350000 to uh, improve their wastewater lift station. And then pending with this last uh, round of spending bills that uh, passed uh, yesterday or this morning, um, it would be 150000 for Viterbo to support rural nursing efforts. $1.6 million for Scenic Bluffs Community Health Centers to expand uh, to Prairie du Chien with a new clinic. And uh, $1 million for the Jackson County Child Care Network to increase access uh, for child care. Uh, I want to touch quickly on the border security and immigration uh, bipartisan compromise. Uh, Senator Baldwin did support uh, this bill that would have updated our asylum system, as well as hire more Border Patrol agents and increase resources for screening technology at the border. Unfortunately, though, this month's long bipartisan effort failed in the Senate last month. Uh, in response, uh, the Senate went on to pass in strong bipartisan fashion, a national security supplemental that took some of the, what that bill was. Uh, so, um, so this new version includes uh, help for our allies, humanitarian assistance, uh, as well as Senator Baldwin supported Fend Off Fentanyl Act, which would crack down both on Chinese chemical producers and suppliers, as well as Mexican cartels. Uh, this bill now awaits action in the House. And all um, a reversal, Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act, uh, this has passed through the House. Senator Baldwin has come out to support the bill, um, and, this has, uh, and she has asked the Senate to also pass the measure. Uh, this would cut taxes for working families with an enhanced child tax credit. It would also support Wisconsin manufacturers that invest in American innovation and bolster Wisconsin's main streets and small businesses. Uh, so those were the remarks I had uh, prepared for this morning. Uh, like I said, happy to hear back and report back to uh, the Senator if anyone else has anything to say. As you may guess, our, the representatives have a difficult time probably addressing specific concerns or um, that would be better left to <laughs> the people they're standing in for this morning, but they're not here. But if you have uh, areas of general concern or things that you'd like to pass on, um, I'll pass the mic. Uh, this is a question or a comment or something. Um, you mentioned the, all the staff and certain things that they could go, you know, you can get a flag or <laughs> all these. But I want to make a comment to pass on to um, Mr. Van Orden. There's no way to do that. When I've called the office here in town, they said, oh, we don't do that. You have to call the Washington office directly. So for all those things you offer, you, it's not offered a place to leave an opinion. So the, I, I just quickly, I apologize for whomever uh, may have answered the phone that day, um, but I answer it pretty regularly. And I'm always happy to take comments and um, uh, concerns. So I apologize for that. Um, I would like to uh, make a comment on the uh, the growing mental health issues in our country and that it is not nearly enough priority in our budgets, in our training of doctors, um, on all really on all levels. Um, my husband and I have volunteered with the homeless population in La Crosse and a huge, huge percentage of them have mental health issues which they've then self-medicated because there was no other care available to them. So then ed uh, addiction gets added on. Some of them just started out as with learning disabilities as a child, and so they failed from the beginning. Um, some of them were from abusive families. We think PTSD only happens to soldiers. It's not. It's all through our society because of the violence. Um, we have children who are afraid in school because of mass shootings. Um, my grandchildren express that to me themselves. Um, there's so many areas in our country, the level of violence and everything, that is really feeding our mental health issues. COVID just added a little bit to it. We're blaming a lot on COVID, but there was so much more even before that. Um, I believe that our government does some of the funding for residencies, for training. Um, if you don't have a job, you don't have coverage for mental health care. If you have a job, but you don't have insurance, you have no coverage. If you have a job and have insurance that doesn't cover mental health care, you still don't have it. But I have a friend recently who's a senior citizen, um, worked for the university, um, has all kinds of reasons why he has the right insurance coverage, but he was told it would be 90 days before he could see someone. 
and he's suffering from a lot of anxiety from a severe heart issue, which just adds to his heart problem. But he was told 90 days even though he had full coverage because there's no availability. So it's really a serious issue that's costing our country a lot of money. Homelessness costs our country a lot of money. Appreciate those comments. And I do just want to say that Senator Baldwin, and especially in her position on the health committee, as well as the subcommittee uh, that she appropriates on, um, it's a very high priority, you know, and it's, it's a lot, there's a lot that needs to be done yet. We totally understand and agree with it, so. Uh, just, just for some clarification, when, when each representative talks about, uh, you know, what money has gone to the Terbo and what money has gone to the vets, what is the overarching source of that money? Is that, is that Biden's budget? Is that the ARPA funding? Is that the ACA funding? Where, because I'm assuming that, that once you get the bulk of money, then you, you get to delineate where it's going to go. But what is the overarching source of, of the money that uh, is being sent to our communities? So, yeah, so when we speak of these congressionally directed spending projects, this is not adding to dollars already th that are allocated. So these are existing pots that are already usually in grant form that exist in the government. And what these CDS requests do is that instead of these local governments, nonprofits, instead of going through the grant cycle, they come to us explaining their need and us then working on their behalf for the projects that we do want to, to try to push across. Um, then directing, if it gets to the finish line like th these just have now, directing to the agency, um, hey, we believe this is a very worthwhile effort for this um, you know, project. We're instructing you now to work with them to release funds uh, in, in that matter. So it's not, these aren't boosting anything. These, are one, these were dollars already that are created under programs that already exists. I don't know if that answers the question. I'm just going to repeat her question. She's asking who, who really decides how that money is allocated once it's there to be allocated. So, so you're more like the pools that each office then works with. Is that? I think I think I'm I think Margaret's asking where did the funds originate? Yeah, so the your these are annual spending bill dollars then. So um just throwing just make believe numbers, but you know, the FY24 budget's going to, you know, allocate X dollars for department Z. Department Z then funnels that dollars down into, you know, all their programming and grants, and that would include then these CDSs. I've got another question I'm going to try to get back here too before we end. I'm sorry. I hope that makes a little, I, and I apologize if I, because Medicare and Social Security, that's their own, that's a whole different silo in terms of dollars. So this is FY, these are your annual fiscal year appropriated dollars that these projects come from. Okay, um, I'm Laura. Oh yeah, we, and Senator Baldwin definitely advocates for increases to the. I'm Laura. I have called Derek Van Norden's office in DC 
weekly for months and sometimes more than once a week about one issue and that is the funding for Ukraine. Um, we have over 30,000 civilians who have been killed and he refuses to fund it. And I started to ask for a letter to be sent, sent to me and I have never received a letter. I say my address at the beginning. I will even ask them at the end, are you sending me a letter? They say yes and I say, what's my address? And they say, well, tell it to me again. It's kind of very frustrating to call his office and it feels as if those actual views of constituents are not being recorded um, when they are sent. And so I guess I'm asking, what is your process for recording that and actually sending it to the representative? So, yeah, again, I apologize on the behalf of the office, um, but we do have a process and um, I will give you my card and Debbie, I will also give you my card so you can call me personally um, and I'll make sure that you get a response um, within the week or within two weeks, as soon as it can get out of DC. So we do have one person who is assigned to correspondence, that's his job. So I'll definitely look into uh, your comments and make sure that you get a response. Thank you. Okay, we're a little bit past 10.30, so we'll... Oh, could I make just one quick comment? I know there is a lot of uh, uh, literature being sent around and, and advertisements against uh, the congressman in that he's going to be cutting Social Security and Medicare. And I just want to assure you, he is fully supportive of the food stamps program, SNAP. He's fully supportive of Social Security, and he's fully supportive of Medicare. He believes with Social Security, you've earned it. Every, you've worked hard for it, it's your money. Um, Medicare, we all need um, um, uh, health services. And with the food stamps program, he grew up in rural poverty, he grew up on food stamps. So he is no way, shape, or form going to cut any of those programs. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, for this morning and presenting for this floor to speak. Very, very good job. And I think I turn this over to Jane. So thank you to all of our representatives today. It's been a great time to be able to uh, hear directly from them and have a chance to ask questions. Really appreciate this. And Ellen does a great job. Got another hand of applause for Ellen. <laughs> so I'm just going to wrap it thank yous. I wanted to thank the waterfront and the staff for the excellent breakfast. They work so well with us when we prepare all of our reservations and stuff. We really enjoy being here. And the beautiful river today is an added bonus. Um, thank you for Rob and AVS to help with the uh, work on the AV stuff today and he was able to correct that uh, mic situation so that was wonderful. I thank the program committee. Um, Deborah Bufton is our chair. Barbara Soderin's over at the computer monitoring to see what it looks like from home. Um, we also have Leslie and, oh gosh, I hope I'm not missing somebody, but also Karen, Karen and Deb, um, Maureen Kinney and Ellen, of course, to coordinate, contact um, uh, legislators and help coordinate this morning. And then our social media team, uh, Nora wasn't able to be here, but she and her team worked so well with um, getting the news releases out. And the, although we didn't release this to the media because it is a members and guests only, but generally they do a nice job with the graphics and um, getting the word out about our, and we appreciate that. Um, so I guess that is it for the thank yous. Thank you all for being here. It's nice to see you all. And each time I get to meet somebody new and, and get to know you personally, which I appreciate. Program is going to be April 10th at the um, Upper Mississippi River Refuge on Bryce's Prairie, and that'll be our April 10th Lunch and Learn. Reservations are now available on the website. We're going to be celebrating 100 years of wildlife preservation in the Upper Mississippi River Valley. Since we're both 100 years old today, or this year, I think there's going to be some birthday cake. So. <laughs> And um, our annual meeting will be right here at the waterfront on uh, May 21st. And we're going to have some wonderful history the Centennial Committee has been putting together. So it'll be a fun evening of some history and uh, trivia, I believe. And so that's for members and guests. And um, most importantly, I want to make sure that everybody votes um, by April 2nd. Early absentee voting is in place now. 
And then April 2nd, of course, is the big day. So vote. I won't say ver vote early and often, but do vote. Thank you all for coming and have a wonderful afternoon.